plan for today is to continue discussing learning theory and we will study the behavior of the estimation error. So, um, as we discussed last time, the empirical risk minimizer provides you a classifier fn star. This has a true risk risk of fn star. And we already predefined the function class f. The best possible risk on this uh, function class f is r star f. And our goal was to upper bound this difference between the two risks, and that's what we call estimation error. Oops. And we had this theorem that this is less than two times the supremum over your function class f. The empirical risk of a function minus the true risk of that function. Is this the null notation? This r star f, that's uh, the same as we had before. The best risk on function class f. That's what we used. Okay? So that's the best risk on function class f. That's the best true risk on function class f. That's the true risk of the function your algorithm provides after seeing n data points. This is the estimation error. And uh, we have this theorem that this estimation error can be upper bounded two times the supremum of this difference. So what's this? For any function f, this is the empirical risk of that function and this is the true risk of that function. And then we were going to bound this difference. And to bound this difference, we used Hövning's inequality and proved that if your function class has capital N elements, then this supremum can be upper bounded this way. This, is a, this supremum is a random variable, so the bounding, uh, we, we bounded this random variable using tail inequalities. So the probability that this random variable is bigger than epsilon, we proved that that's smaller than a number. And when we used inversion, then we got this inequality. The issue is that those function classes that have finite elements, they are not that exciting. And then we started to think about what to do uh, in those cases when it has infinite number of elements. And to analyze this, behavior when the function class has infinite elements, uh, we started with this observation that this r hat and f cannot have arbitrarily many different behaviors. If you, we are thinking on classification using the zero one loss, uh, if you have n training points, then this could have only two to the n different behaviors because, uh, um, you know, this guy can only be zero or one. Oops. All right. Uh, so our goal will be to bound this random variable. And the key step will be that we, will pro we, we proved that this random variable, in some sense, is close to the expect its expectation. We used the McDermott inequality to prove that. And then we just needed to upper bound it. Um, the mean, the expected value of this random variable. 
right? So this is the Magdalene inequality which says that this random variable we care about is close to its mean. It's close to its expected value. Right, so this was the picture. We have n random variables. As we increase n, the random variable is getting closer and closer to its mean. And uh, um, so we just, it's enough to upper bound after McDermott's inequality, uh, enough to upper bound the expected values. All right, then we introduced the notation of, of shattering coefficients for a function class f. And we mentioned that uh, this expected value uh, can be upper bounded with this so called VC inequality, where this guy here, S of F, and is the shattering coefficient. And if you put everything together, so with McDermott, we proved that this supremum is close to the expected value. This expected value can be upper bounded with this. If you put these things together, then you can prove this inequality. Right, and uh, then we started to analyze these shattering coefficients. Any questions so far? So we all did this last time, right? So uh, we introduced the notation of S O F X one X N. which was just this expression, the maximum different behavior of this n-dimensional vector that you have n training points, for each of them you apply a function f and you count how many different n-dimensional vector you can get uh, in your function class f. And that was uh, sf x1 xn. And the shattering coefficients, the shattering coefficients sfn was defined as the maximum of this SF X1 XN over all X1 X2 XN. Right, and uh, then we define the VC dimension as the first sample size where this SFN beha stops behaving like 2 to the N. Right, so we saw some. Ex we looked at some examples like linear classifiers, where, for example, in 2D, when we had when n was one, n was two, or n was three, then this SFN was two, four, and eight, but but after that SF four was less than sixteen, and then we said that the VC dimension in this case case was three. So it's it's the last it's the last uh, dimension. Last sample size, sample size it's still where it's still two to the n. Right, uh, and that was the notation. If the VC dimension is n, then you can find n points uh, in your domain such that no uh, those n points can be shattered. That is, no matter how you label those n points, what the class label of those n points are, there will be a classifier that can solve perfectly that classification problem. But if you have n plus one points. Uh, then it doesn't matter how you choose those points in your domain. Your opponent could always choose a labeling such that you wouldn't be able to classify those points. Any questions so far? So the VC dimension in some sense measures how rich your function class is, how complicated functions you can allow. Because if you have, uh, say, n points, and uh, the VC dimension is, say, 2 to the n, the maximum, sorry, the, uh, not the VC dimension, this uh, shattering coefficient is 2 to the n, it means that for any kind of labelings, uh, you can find a classifier that would, perfect, that would be able to solve that problem without error. So you can fit very complicated functions to those points. Um, so in some sense, it, it means that you have to be careful to keep this VC dimension small, otherwise you might be able to overfit. So 
what makes us to think that it is not going to overfit if it is less than 2 to the power of n? Maybe so it's still I, large. Could it could be still large, you, I agree. I'm just saying if it's 2 to the n, it means that you cannot really learn anything, right? Because for any labeling, there would be a function that would perfectly fit your training set. And it wouldn't mean anything how would to generalize uh, for larger sets, right? But you are right, it could be still large. But the issue is that uh, if you, uh, so we, we see that if you keep this VC dimension, so it's a fixed number, then after this, this curve here, it stops behaving exponentially. It will be polynomial with the degree VC dimension. So you want your sample size to be much bigger than the Yes, yes, sure. And this is universal, no matter what f is? It's, uh, so f has to be in your function set, but it's universal in that sense that it doesn't matter what's your distribution p, x, y is. All right, and then uh, I think this is where we stopped last time. So let's see some examples. So one example can be that uh, let the domain be two-dimensional. And let's just use, instead of linear classifiers, let's just use uh, decision stumps, which means that your decision uh, lines could be either vertical or horizontal only. Okay? So that's your function class. Either vertical or horizontal lines, straight lines. And then the question is, uh, what's the VC dimension of this function class when the uh, dimension of your domain is 2? Okay, so let's think about this. So if we can see that there's a placement of three points that can be shattered, then it means that the VC dimension uh, is at least three. So if I, for example, if I can prove that these three points can be shattered, that is, they, uh, I can see all the eight different behaviors on these three points, it means that the VC dimension is at least three, right? And we can see that it's indeed the case. So if we have these three points, it doesn't matter how I label them. There are eight different labelings, right? It doesn't matter which one I choose out of these eight different labelings. There would be a classifier, either vertical line or horizontal line, that would be able to perfectly classify um, these points. Any questions so far? So that's the same VC dimension as a linear separator? The VC dimension is just a number. Yeah, right. even though it's a much smaller class. Like right, it's, it's a subclass of, of linear classifiers, right. right? Yep, but still. But still the same VC mm -hmm. OK, so let's see what happens when we have four points. So that's clear so far. We can see the VC dimension is at least three. If I can choose four points, such that on those four, four points I could also see the 2 to the 4, 16 different behaviors, that would mean that the VC dimension is at least 4, right? So let's see if we can find uh, those four points. So for example, what happens if these four points look like this? Then I can see that if I choose the labeling like this, uh, then I wouldn't be able to classify these points with Decision stamps, yes? Wouldn't that imply what he said that because these are subclass of linear classifiers and it array, it array attained three, the least is three. Then Let's assume we don't know the VC dimension of linear classifiers. Okay, I just want to see examples. Yeah. But you are right. Yeah. Uh, all right, so I can choose uh, this labeling that I wouldn't be able to classify perfectly. Uh, what happens if the four points look like this? Can I find a labeling that I wouldn't be able to classify these points? Yeah. 
Yes. Exactly. Right. And uh, another case could be the, if the four points look like this, then yes, as, as I can see that if I choose this labeling, again, I wouldn't be able to classify them the decision stumps. How do you prove that? So the proving, yeah, that's, that's the art part or the tricky part. Um, so you have to be careful, and sometimes it's tedious. Um, but I hope that you can see that I mean, with some effort, we would be able to prove this, right? It's just geometry in this case. But uh, you are right that there's no general recipe how to prove this for arbitrary function classes. Um, that's the art part. OK, but now we can see that the, because of that, the VC dimension is 3. OK, let's see another uh, set of classifiers. So in this case, so any question about this? Sorry. Is it clear that the VC dimension of uh, decision stumps is 3, in this case, when the domain of, is, uh, the dimension of the domain of your features is 2? OK, so then let's see another class. So in this case, the classifiers uh, look like axis parallel rectangles. So the classifier can say that inside of my rectangle, it's class 1. Outside of this rectangle is class 0, or class minus, class plus. The domain of the features, again, is a two-dimensional Euclidean space. And let's. Um, calculate the VC dimension of this uh, function class. Is the goal clear? So this is my function class. We want to see the VC dimension. Again, we choose three different points. If we can prove that for any labelings of these three different points, uh, the classifier can always perfectly classify these labelings, then it means that the VC dimension is at least 3. And indeed, no matter how you choose the labelings, you can always fit a rectangle that's compatible with your labelings. OK, so the VC dimension, can you see that? The VC dimension is at least 3. So what happens if we have four points? So for example, these four points. Now there are 16 different labelings. But even for that 16 different labelings, we can prove that uh, our classifier could perfectly classify uh, those points, no matter what the labelings are. Okay, so I try to list some of the possible labelings. So for example, if the labeling looks like this, you just fit a classifier like this. If your labeling looks like this, you fit a rectangle like this. If your labeling looks like this, you fit a rectangle like this, and so on. Can you do all the opposite? I mean, uh, I mean everything that's inside is uh, positive, or positive? Can you do it either way? Uh, sure. So I just choose the classifiers. So that was my function class. That. Uh, Inside, so I. So inside it has to be. Yes, yeah, so that's how you fix your classifier. You say that inside of this rectangle it has to be this class. Yes? Then, on the case of Matthew pass Matthew in a line. So you choose your four points, and then your opponent chooses the labelings, right? If, if you can only classify negative point inside the rectangle, then maybe class negative cannot be cannot be classified in the. So can you draw that example? <coughs> we have four points now, right? Or you just Sorry, simple heads. Okay, so I'm the one who can choose the points first, and then my opponent chooses the labeling. I decided to choose my four points in a general location. 
Okay? So I choose these four points. Now you are my opponent. You choose the labeling. So what labelings you would choose for these four points? So you cannot choose these four points because I choose the points. That's the game. I choose the points, you choose the labelings. Okay, so my point is no matter what labelings you would choose, I could fit a rectangle <laughs> to those labelings that would solve the problem. Okay, so that's the game. Any question? Does it make sense this way? So I choose the points such a way that on those points I chose, I want to show that it can achieve 2 to the n uh, different, I can get, see the 2 to the n different behaviors. In other words, no matter what labelings my opponent, say you, choose, I should be able to classify them. But I make the first step, I choose the points in the domain. Alright, so let's see what happens if we have five points. So now we know that the VC dimension is at least four, right? What happens if we have five points? Uh, then we can have these different, different cases. For example, four points are collinear. I choose these five points this way. Then it turns out if I choose these five points this way, my opponent can choose labeling such a way that I wouldn't be able to uh, fit a rectangle that's compatible with that labeling. Okay. If I choose the five points this way, again, you could choose a labeling that's not compatible. Um, you could choose a labeling that I couldn't classify with my function class. If I choose these five points, again, my opponent could choose a labeling that I cannot fit a classifier there. Yes? Can we not invert the classifier? If so I, uh, that I, we've already fixed, so the setup is that you fixed the function class, and the function class was that, that inside the rectangle, that's class one. All right, if we have these five points, uh, any comments, Alex? No, I was just mentioning that as you increase the number of points, basically, at some point, you will run out of possibilities. And so now what we're seeing already is that the complexity is dependent on the layout of points. So in other words, there's a, we're seeing that there's a gap opening up between what you can do depending on the distribution of the data. And that's actually going to be kind of a big source of discrepancy between mm -hmm. worst case bounds and what happens in reality. That in reality, data is much more nicely distributed than what the worst case bounds give Sure, you. sure. Right, so we discussed worst case scenario yes. here. And this is why often learning theory bounds can be rather loose, because, yeah, it's just much right. harder to prove something for the typical case. Yeah, so word is not always that cruel that the theory shows, right? Okay, so if we have these five points, again, uh, my opponent can choose a labeling such that I wouldn't be able to fit a rectangle to those points. So bottom line, no matter how I choose those five points, my opponent could choose a labeling such that with this predefined function class, I wouldn't be able to classify those points perfectly. So in this case, the VC dimension, because of that, it's four. Any questions? Do you have any measure on like, uh, so for example, the pathological examples mm -hmm. in the worst case scenario, do you have a measure of like how often do that happen? Like for example, in optimization, I know that like sometimes you know your worst case scenario just happens on a measure set on a set of measures zero. So you know that almost surely. Your right, so I think it depends on your uh, distribution of your input outputs, right? But for example, in, in, in R2, right, like linear points have dimension, you know, measures here. Right, but still you have to start with the as assumption on distribution of x and y for that, right? But the definition of the VC dimension does it depend on the distribution. Right, so that's why it's a worst case plan. So it remove it, it's a universal bound. So do you have, then my question is, do you have 
a BCI mesh definition that depends on the distribution that makes the bounce type. So right, so there are um, so there are better results than this. So let me just say this, okay? Um, there are even data de dependent bounds as well. So in some sense, all our, these bounds are just depending on the sample size. There are bounds that depend on the data as well. Um, so there are much better results than this. Okay, so, <clears throat> so let's come back to our theorem that we proved here. So we had uh, this theorem that uh, the expected value of the supremum we care about, that could be upper bounded with two times square root uh, logarithm, uh, two times shattering coefficients divided by n, and square root of the whole thing. And another corollary was that the probability of uh, that this supremum is bigger than t could have been upper bounded with this expression. Again, this expression is depending on the shattering coefficients. And what we are going to do now is that we will upper bound the shattering coefficients with the VC dimension. Okay, so this theorem says that the probability sup f is in function class f The empirical risk of f minus the true risk of f. This is a random variable, so the, the probability that this random variable is bigger than t is smaller than four times uh, squared shattering coefficients times an exponentially decaying term. All right, so there is an important lemma, which is called Sauer's lemma, which says that this shuttering coefficient can be upper bounded in this form. SFN is not bigger than k is going from zero to the VC dimension of the function class F. And n choose k. And of course, we already know that SFn is less than two to the n. So you know, a very, very, very naive theorem could be that I just replace this SFn with two to the n. But that's a very loose bound. We want to upper bound this SFn because. This is exponential n. We want to upper bound this SFN in terms of VC dimension. And if you look at this guy here, what's the nice property of this? Polynomial. Right, it's polynomial in n. So, so far we had an exponential bound on SFN. But if you know the VC dimension, then it turns out that this FFN can be upper bounded using this polynomial form. So it's a polynomial that can be, you know, much tighter uh, than exponential. And two very simple corollary is that from this Sauer lemma, you can prove these two inequalities that SFN is less than n plus 1 to the VC dimension. It's very cute, right? So it just says that this guy is less than this polynomial with VC, where the order of the polynomial is VC dimension. But another form sometimes we use is this. Again, it's a polynomial with degree VC dimension. And you can see that if, say, the VC dimension is uh, bigger than 
E, say at least three, then this could be much tighter than this. Okay, here is a quick question. Can you prove this in a minute from that? So I'm just wondering if you can see how this follows from that. Induction, that could be, uh, yeah, it's just, uh, just think about what this, uh, using the binomial theorem. Anyhow, uh, it would be nice if you could sp spend a few minutes at home and prove these inequalities. Is E like the two point? Like yeah, that, that's E is the, e, the Euler constant. That's why I'm saying the VC dimension is bigger than say three then this term just looks better than this. <laughs> hmm? Sure, but uh, these are finite results. Any question about this? So can you appreciate the beauty of this, that now I could just put this n plus one to the VC dimension here. And then I would have an inequality that bounds uh, this expression. And we already know that this expression bounds the uh, estimation error. So we do have a bound on the estimation error in terms of VC dimension. And quite often you can calculate the VC dimension for certain function crosses, or at least you can bound them. For example, in, for d-dimensional linear classifiers, we already know that this VC dimension is d plus one. So I could just put uh, you know, d plus one here and plug these guys here. It seems to be hard in general to bound it from above. Like Very true. <laughs> Generally, it can be hard. But for certain important special cases, we know uh, how to bound this. So the smaller the VC dimension, the better our generalization. Yes. If the say VC dimension is infinite, these are meaningless, these theorems. Yeah, but on the other hand, the farther away your R F star F is from the true uh, So uh, can you repeat your question? I'm saying the smaller the VC dimension mm -hmm. is the farther your, your true, uh, true risk is from your true risk on, on the best function you yeah. have. So uh, let's go back. Yeah, the approximation error. Oh, sure, uh, right. So there are two things. We care about the estimation error and the approximation error as well. Uh, here we assume that you fixed your function class f. And then we studied how the estimation error behaves. And you are right, what in practice people do, that you actually increase the function class as well as you have larger and larger training points. You increase the complexity of the function class, and you can even measure that uh, complexity with, with VC dimension. Uh, and you do that because you want to minimize the approximation error as well. So if you fix, if your VC dimension is very small, then you would always have a big approximation error here. Um, you want to avoid that too, because ideally you want to have classifiers that in the limit would achieve the base risk. Good. Okay, so so back to Sauer's one, huh? If we have time, we can prove this Sauer lemma maybe in ten minutes. Uh, or f might be 15. Uh, let's just keep that proof for
for a sec and let's uh, see the corollaries of this lemma and just accept that we prove this. Okay? So the statement of that lemma is clear for now, right? <coughs> All right. So say we prove the SAW lemma and uh, So from now on, we know that SF uh, n is smaller than n plus 1 to the VC dimension. And we also know that this is not bigger than n times E divided with the VC dimension and putting this to the VC dimension. OK, so let's accept that we know this. And let's see the corollaries of this. So we already proved that if the function class f uh, has n elements, then uh, the expectation of this supremum we care about could be up bounded with log 2 times n divided by 2n. I, do you see inequality? Isn't it straight from the upper inequalities? This so, one? Yeah, because. You know that SFN is the most, you know, like, effectively that's the number of fun different functions you have. Uh, so that's like the end of the... But if you replace big N by SFN... So why can you do that? Because you know that uh, even N, the... You could have like a huge set of um, set of functions, but you know that effectively on these on these endpoints you have at most S F N different behaviors from your classifiers. So you just have like n different. Actually, you just have like n dif big n different functions. Like you cannot distinguish more behaviors than that. So right. So that's yeah. That's true. So yeah, you could have like an infinite set of functions, but you don't, you know, like if you see endpoints, you don't distinguish more than S of n. So my question is, which one is following from which in your argument? VC goes from, VC follows from the upper, the finite version. But what if you, uh, if your function class has infinite elements. It doesn't matter because you have endpoints and you see, you, you just see. Right, but that's, that then, that's the lower case then. The capital N is the number of functions. Yeah, but the number of, func the number of different classifiers you have from F, from right. F is N. Okay. So, uh, so you have endpoints. Yeah, the N. number of different classifiers can be two to the N, right? No, as if N, as if N, as if N. Sure. Uh, infinite. This, what? So n is the number of training size. Still, the number of classifiers is still infinite. F capital F could could be infinite. Infinity, but the number of behaviors that these classifiers, the number, the number of ways in which this classifier can behave on those n. Behave is just S F n. Right. It's. So you effectively have just S F. And right, so that's the intuition, but... Um, but but, but there's a real risk, risk, so you can't... Uh, in the expectation, there is the true risk, and that can uh, have infinite domain values. Right, so this... Uh, I mean, I, I can see your right. intuition, but it's not a formal proof. All right, so we know this, and from Sauer lemma, what we can do is that we can upper bound this SFN with this expression, n plus 1 to the VCF. So the log SFN can be upper bounded with VC times log n plus 1. And I have log 2 because of this too.
all right? And originally we were carrying, so our main interest is the estimation error, this expression. And we know that the estimation error can be upper bound with two times this supremum. And now we have uh, bound on the expectation of this supremum, which is this expression. So at the end, what we get that we have a bound on the expected expectation of this difference. Uh, so this expected estimation error can be upper bounded if you put things together four times VC log n plus one divided by n. So what we can see now, if you have a fixed VC dimension, even if the function class has infinite many elements, but the VC dimension is finite, then the estimation error, if you use empirical risk minimization, is going to zero with square root of n rate. Any question on this? All right, so this is what we know. And in some special cases, we know the VC dimension. For example, we discussed if you are in a d-dimensional space and you have linear classifiers, then the VC dimension is just d plus one. We can plug the d plus one to the VC dimension here, and then what we have is that the estimation error can be upper bounded this way in d-dimensional spaces. If you do a feature map first to a, I don't know, d prime dimensional space, then of course you just need to replace this d with d prime. So after feature transformation, you will have this error on the estimation error. So d prime is the dimension of your feature space. I think that if you use, for example, vector machines with uh Gauss yeah, so these theorems don't say anything about those. They don't apply? We don't know. No, so there is that theory how to handle support vector machines with infinite, with Gaussian kernel and to prove that they do something reasonable. But these theorems don't say anything about that. Is it because d prime becomes plus? Is it, is it, it's because this uh, d prime would be infinite. If you use Gaussian kernel. If you use polynomial kernel, that's a different story, then of course this would be a finite number. So this implies that uh, the feature map actually leads to a higher chance of overfitting? Sorry, this implies that the feature map? Uh, leads to more overfitting? So if you go to a higher dimensional space, uh, then you might overfit easily. So basically, this means that it doesn't help you that you're projecting from a lower dimensional space. The bound is still the higher dimensional space, which can hurt you. So the higher dimensional space can hurt you, right? But uh, so what you do that you go, you can do a nonlinear map that goes from a space, small dimensional space, to a higher dimensional space. And in that higher dimensional space, you can do linear classification. And for that linear classification, we have theory how the estimation error would behave in that. Dimension, but the cost you pay is here that you will have d prime here, not d. Okay, and again, this is a theorem on the expectation of the risk, true risk of your empir uh, empirical risk minimizer classifier minus the true risk of the best possible classifier achievable in your function cluster. All right. Uh, so we bounded this expectation. But originally we cared about not just the expectation of this random variable, but the whole the distribution of this random variable. And we just proved it with McDermid mid inequality that this supremum is close to the expectation of this. And uh, that's the concentration bound. On this expectation, uh, the VC inequalities uh, told us this bound. If you put all these, uh, these two 
uh, the Bagdarmid inequality and the VC inequality together, then you get this VC theorem which bounds this random variable with the tail inequality. Instead of using bound on the expectation of this random variable, we bound the tail behavior of this random variable. And then again, you can do the same thing, that you can replace this SF, uh, the shuttering coefficients, uh, with bounds on the, with VC dimension, either using this or this. Okay, um, in some books you can see this inequality, in some books you can see this inequality, they are almost the same. All right, so another thing you can do, if we have this inequality on the uh, top line, then you can do inversion on this inequality as well, and then you would get something like this, that if delta is small, then with high probability, this inequality holds. And again, we just need to rebound uh, the log of the shattering coefficients. And in this case, for example, we can choose this inequality instead of this, doesn't matter too much. And then you would get an inequality uh, looking like this. And at the end, of course, we care about the estimation error, which is less than two times the supremum that we just bounded. So if you put everything together, you get that we can get a bound on the tail behavior of the estimation error. So this estimation error, we can prove that with high probability, the estimation error is less than this quantity. In the previous slide, we bounded the expectation of this guy. And now we bound the tail behavior of this guy. Any questions? Again, so what's the message of this? Uh, if you have a finite VC dimension, then the estimation error, uh, on the estimation error, you have this uh, square root of n bound. So with high probability, the estimation error is going to zero with rate square root of n. Is there a straight log in there or something? So uh, log yeah, so. Uh, yeah. So let's not worry too much about this log. They are small. So, I mean, in n, these are constants except this log n. So it's log n divided by square root of n. All right, so this is what we did. Uh, what we care about really is that we want classifiers that achieve the base risk. So you want the risk of your classifier to be close to the base risk as much as possible. What we did that we fixed the function class f and then we analyzed how, with what kind of speed this estimation error can go to zero. <coughs> In practice, what you do actually is not just this, but it's even more complicated. You increase the function class f with n. And uh, sometimes how people do that, that they choose function classes with increasing VC dimensions. But how to do it right, that can be quite complicated. So any questions about these results? Do they make sense? Okay, so I know that the equations can be quite complicated. So how you can learn about that, that you go home, you look at the equations, check where you got lost, and you ask me if you have questions on them. So other difficulties that we didn't prove everything because then it would take forever. We just proved some, um, you know, main building blocks. Uh, but there are many tiny details that we didn't prove. Any questions? So are they being used for models selection mm -hmm. in uh, Exactly, uh, yep. How, how would you do that? So do you directly compare the VC dimensions? Of so for uh, some function classes, you can calculate the VC dimension. And uh, you choose uh, VC dimension that has the right complexity for you. 
Um, so for example, that's used for decision trees. And if you want, I, I can send you papers on it, how uh, using the VC dimension of decision trees is used for choosing the right model complexity. The issue is that we, we use these bounds to select the right model, but these bounds in practice might be quite loose. Um, but oh well. Okay. So in practice, usually, what's the is is there a best way of selecting a model? Is cross validation or something? Do we have enough data, or or, or it varies? So uh, it varies really. Um, in some cases, you cannot afford cross validation. It's too big. Um, yes. It's right. It would take forever. Uh, sometimes you do bootstrapping. Sometimes you use cross validation. Sometimes you can use this. So there is no general recipe that. I would say you should do this. There are these other criteria like AIC, BIC yeah. also used. Sometimes they fail completely. Sometimes they are working nicely. Um, and there are you know, theorems, what are those conditions when they work nicely. But in practice, checking those conditions can be, again, difficult. So um, What and happens if, like, sometimes, like, you know, like, you use BIC or AIC and it tells you, like, oh, this model is supposed to have, like, better likelihood or something, and then you do, you, exp you know, like, you compute some tail bounds and then tell you the other model. <laughs> right, so at the end, you know, they... You just, like, trust your intuition? Yes. Uh, they... You just have to try them in practice and see which one works. Um, because... Um, Really, I, you can see cases where someone says, in this case, AIC worked fine for uh, complexity selection. But I can show you papers where they just completely failed, AIC and BIC. Um, all right, so here is the question. Do you want to see the proof of the sauer lemma, or do you want to see some results on manifold learning? Let's vote manifold learning. Sauer lemma. I'm the only one? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I recommend you to check the proof in the slides because it's very cute. And um, it's not that trivial how to prove it. All right, so I will, we only have like 20 minutes, so I will try to be quick on this, okay? So what we mean on manifold, so I will not be formal at all here. I'm just saying that uh, a manifold is that if you, um, so manifold is any kind of object that if you look at that object from close enough, it looks flat. Okay, that's the informal definition. So all these kind of guys, they are manifolds. Uh, these are one-dimensional manifolds. These are two-dimensional manifolds, because if you look at them from close enough, um, they look like two-dimensional flat surfaces, would be preserved. All pairwise distances. All pairwise distances. Or even if not preserved, you know, what, then I can ask what's... Absolutely. Right, what's uh, the best embedding that would keep most of these distances. All right, so here is what we are going to do. Uh, so say, originally we had a data set with, and in this data set we have feature vectors x i, x j, x k. And the distances between these feature vectors are denoted with uh, D. So D K J is the distance between X I X J. D I J is the distance between X I X J, and so on. Then, uh, using the cosine law, I know that uh, this equation holds. Oops. Where cosine alpha is this uh, 
the cosine of this angle. So that's the cosine rule. <clears throat> Let the inner product between these two vectors be denoted between these two vectors be denoted with bij. So we know that bij is uh, the product of these distances times the cosine alpha. And from these two equations, we can see that the inner product between these two vectors, so the inner product between xi minus xk and xj minus xk, uh, I can get this inner product using these distances. So if you give me distances only between feature vectors, I can use those distances uh, to estimate this kind of inner product between these vectors. All right. Um, if your data is centered, we assume it, the data is centered, then using similar arguments that I just uh, use, did in the previous slide, using distances, dij, di, and dil, and so on. So using all kinds of distances between feature vectors, uh, you, can S, you can calculate uh, the inner products between any two feature vectors. Okay, so you can prove that this equation holds if the inner product between xi and xj can be calculated using this equation. And what we are going to do in multidimensional scaling, you got the distances between any of those two points, xi and xj. You calculate the inner product between xi and xj using these distances. And you want to find y1, y2, y endpoints in a low dimensional space such that you want to keep all these inner products. So that's one version of multidimensional scaling, but there are lots of other versions. And here is an algorithm that can uh, do this. So you calculate these inner products. In other words, you calculate this gram matrix. In this gram matrix, you calculate the top k eigenvalues, sorry, eigenvectors. These are psi 1, psi 2, psi k. And then we uh, right. So this, um, you are in an n-dimensional space. So you had n feature vectors. So G, this gram matrix, is n by n. You calculate the top k eigenvectors of G. So uh, you calculate the top k n-dimensional vectors. So these are psi 1, psi 2, psi k. So this is an n times k matrix. Uh, lambda are the top k eigenvalues of uh, this uh, matrix G. And then we just say that let the embedded points be y1, y2, y, and be defined uh, with this matrix product. OK, so you just need to use the eigenvectors and eigenvalues of this matrix. You know, it's very similar to PCA. So when we uh, discuss PCA, then we notice that PCA op uh, works on a x times x transpose matrix, and MDS now it just works on a x transpose x matrix. But we do the same kind of things. We want to find the eigenvectors of this matrix. And if you do this embedding, so is it clear what we do? It shouldn't be clear why exactly we do that, but the algorithm should be clear. So from the distances, you calculate this inner product. From this inner product matrix, you calculate the eigenvectors and eigenvalues. Using those eigenvectors, eigenvalues, you generate these points, and you are done. So then here is an application of this. Um, so these are cities in the USA. And you can see the distances between these cities. So that's the input of your algorithm. And the question is if you can reconstruct where these cities are in the US or in 2D. And uh, this is a result if you run that MDS algorithm that we just proved, uh, that I just showed. Um, so it's not too bad, right? Uh, you might need to flip things up. Um, but it's not too bad other than that. So here is another uh, 
data set that I tried. So again, you can see cities in the US, and it is the result of a multidimensional scaling and bending uh, using that data. It's not too bad, right? So at least it kept some structure. Okay, so this is MDS. So I want to show some couple of other algorithms. So uh, this algorithm is called isomap. Uh, it means isometric feature mapping. So what you do is that uh, you have a data matrix, x1, x2, xn, and uh, between any two points, you try to calculate or at least estimate the geodesic distance between these points. So what does it mean? Right, so with respect to the manifold that they might be. Of course, we don't know that manifold, that's the issue. But uh, what you do is that you at least you can approximate. So this is what you do in practice. Say so this is your data set. You want to calculate the geodesic distance from this point to this point. So what you do that uh, you fit, say, a k nearest neighbor graph uh, to this data set. So in each point, you just select the k nearest neighbors or the epsilon nearest neighbors. And then you uh, try to get from this point to this point using this, the edges of this nearest neighbor graph. OK? Uh, so here is one point, here is the second point. And using these edges of the nearest neighbor graph, you want to get to this point, and you want to find the shortest distance using this nearest neighbor graph. So this is how you approximate the geodesic distance, just using k nearest neighbor graphs or epsilon nearest neighbor graphs. And you do that between any two points in your data set, and then you use multidimensional scaling. Okay? So you estimate, instead of using the Euclidean distance between these points in the data set, you estimate the geodesic distance between these points. Uh, so again, geodesic distance that you are allowed to move only to nearest neighbors from each point. So from this point, you are allowed to move to its nearest neighbors. Say so you moved here. Then from this point, you are allowed to move its nearest neighbors. Say so you moved here. And you want to find that path uh, to this point uh, that has minimum lengths, and you can just move to nearest neighbors, local neighbors. Graph search over the entire data set, uh, You can, yes, yeah, so you can. Uh, like, is that computationally? It's computationally it's expensive, but oh well. Even MDS, that's computationally expensive. Well, nearest neighbor, so you have a set of nearest neighbors, or you have a set of fixed In each state? point? Because so, okay. there's only one nearest neighbor, usually. Okay, so. Each point, you can see uh, each point, around each point, you can select so the case, say, five nearest neighbors. Okay, or 10 nearest neighbors, or near epsilon nearest neighbors, which means what are those points that are in an epsilon ball around point. You do that for each point, and then you are allowed to move from each point to its neighbors. So from this point, I move to my neighbor. From this point, I move to my neighbor. And you want to calculate what's the shortest path on this graph from any, between any two points, and what's the distances. You use this distance matrix as an input for the multidimensional scaling algorithm, and that's your uh, isomap algorithm. So it's very simple, right? And still it was published, I don't know, it was published in Nature or Science. Um, so sometimes you don't need much for a publication in this. Uh, Channels. When, when was it published? Hmm? When? When? when um, yeah, 2000, uh, yeah two, early 2000s, yeah. They are not that old, these algorithms. Okay, so here is a result on images. So images are uh, high dimensional vectors, and you, for each image, you calculate what are the nearest neighbor images using Euclidean distance. Using uh, these distances, you calculate, you estimate the geodesic distance between any two images. 
and then you use multidimensional scaling to embed these images, say, to 2D. And as you can see, it keeps some structure that uh, this image turns left, these images are turning left, and top, this is, and these images to right and top, right and bottom, and so on. So this way you can show the nonlinear structure in your data set. You can do the same thing with uh, images of digits, and um, this is my result. Okay, you can do this for interpolation as well. That, for example, you select two points in your data set, and then using this uh, graph, k nearest neighbor graph or epsilon graph, you want to go from this point to this point, and you can show those images that you go through. And then you, ideally you will see some smooth transition from one image to another image. Yes? Are there any theoretical guarantees of this that would help us choose a number of neighbors? Uh, not really. So not on these kind of algorithms. Can you have islands or do you have to do something to make sure it's connected? Um, so I think isomap, so I have a table on that. So let's. Uh, let me let me show that uh, a bit later. So that's a good question. That what kind of properties of these manifolds has to be? That can they have islands? Can they have holes in it? Corners, and so on. Um, so, an just an disconnected uh, so I, I guess you mean that they are just far from. Yeah. So these are some results. If you do on uh, uh, this isomap interpolation on images of, you know, a hand opening and closing. So the nice thing that if you just do use standard Euclidean distances between images, that wouldn't work at all. Um, because the distances, Euclidean distances between these row images, they are just big, no matter what images you choose. All right. So another algorithm I want to show very quickly because that's famous. Wait, it's if the distance is a big, so how do you do nearest neighbor? Uh, so, uh, so except your nearest neighbors, but the other distances, they are very big. Okay. So. Uh, in local linear embedding, you have, um, say, m data points in capital D dimension. And what you do that you try to reconstruct, you, first you select near, some nearest neighbors for XI. So for example, I selected these five nearest neighbors. And then I want to reconstruct this XI point using its neighbors. So what do I mean on that? That I want to solve this problem. What's that W matrix that minimizes uh, this expression? So Xi has to be reconstructed uh, using its neighbors. So Wij um, are some weights if J is a neighbor of Xi and zero otherwise. Does it make sense? So each point xi, you want to reconstruct from its nearest neighbors. And when reconstruct, I mean you want to minimize this. You calculate these w's. And in the next step, next step using the, these w weights, you want to reconstruct the original points or embedded points. So let z points be in a lower dimensional space, z1, z2, zm. Say in a lower dimensional. Now we know w's, and you want to minimize uh, this expression in Z. Okay, so first you try to find those weights uh, for your uh, given. So you have a data set, you try to find those weights that minimize these uh, reconstructions. Then you have these weights and you replace these X's with lower dimensional vectors, say Z's, keeping the same weights. It seems really similar to like autocoder. Right? So it's, it's similar in that sense that uh, you have these W's and you use uh, them. Uh, and, so you can do non-linear, sure. And um, 
you need to have some other constraints. For example, you might assume that the points are centered, and for Ws, you also assume that uh, they sum to one. So, uh, uh, yes. And I just want to show some results. So, if this is your original data set, and you choose the number of neighbors in the right way, and then you embed this data set into 2D, then it would unfold this data set. Here we embedded the digits, uh, the images of these digits into 1D. And these are the embedded image, images. In this data set, you have these shifted faces. And if you embed these images into 2D, then you would get this embedding where, say, this would correspond to this corner, this would correspond to this corner, this would be in the center, and so on. And um, yeah, in the slides, you can see some uh, other examples. So I have to stop here. I just want to mention that there are some other slides on other uh, manifold learning algorithms, such as maximum variance unfolding, um, and some results on that uh, there's, there are slides on Laplacian eigenmap, manifold learning algorithms. Uh, there are some results on variational mixture of uh, factor analyzers. And uh, there's a MATLAB package called Many, where you can try, I think, like eight different manifold learning algorithms on different data sets. And this is where you can compare algorithms and answer your question, what if there's a hole in my data set, then which algorithm would work, which wouldn't work. And uh, and that is this table that I just mentioned, that some algorithms like multidimensional scaling PC, isomap, LLE, Hessian, I, uh, eigenmaps, Laplacian eigenmaps, diffusion map, k nearest neighbor diffusion map. So they are all manifold learning algorithms. And this is a table how well they work if uh, uh, you know, there are clusters in your data set, or islands, or if there are corners in the data set and so on. So you can look at this table, and you can look at some other results. Um, for example, what the diffusion map uh, would do on this kind of data set if you embed this data set to 2D with different parameters. Or if you have this kind of cluster data set and you would embed that. Um, What's LLE? Local linear embedding. Oh. Uh, Right, so how this algorithm would, on, uh, would work on high dimensional data set. So this data set was, uh, this blob here just was moving around, that was the image, and we tried to embed uh, that into 2D, and these are some of the results that we got. So for example, the LLE that just crashed on this data set. You can see some other interesting data sets. So these are three dimensional data sets, and these are the results with multidimensional scaling, PCA, isomap, LLE, Hessian LLE, and so on. Um, these are, again, interesting data sets. So what happens if you, the, your data has corners like this, which algorithm would work, which wouldn't work? You can see that multidimensional scaling, it failed in this case. PCA failed as well. Uh, and this is what happens if you have holes. So here we have a hole in the data set, and then these are the results. The, in this case, the, this Hessian local linear embedding that worked very well, but some of the others failed miserably. All right. So there are lots of details in the slide, so please look at them. If you have questions, then just contact me. Um, similarly, with learning theory, some of the parts were pretty quick, and uh, how you can understand really, you go home, look at the slides, look at the related literature. I gave some pointers um, on the class website. You can look at them too and ask me if you have any questions. All right? 
So see you next week. Minimax. Mm -hmm. So how does the VC bond look like for the Minimax? So, so what happens with VC? Do you have those papers? I don't, I don't ah. know. So in the theory that we discussed, we assume that there's a PXY distribution, right? Mm -hmm. In Minimax, uh, the situation is even more complicated because you assume that you have a function of probability distribution. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we, we assumed in the theory we discussed here that there's a probability distribution PXY and there's a family of classifiers F. And you wanted to find the best classifier that classifies this. In Minimax, you assume that there's a family of distributions as well. So there are two and you want, yeah.